Well, this morning we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. And as you're turning there this morning, I want to start with this. With the COVID-19 pandemic, we are in uncharted waters. There's been a storm. It's been hard to see through the rain. And when we can finally open our eyes and make, make sense of what the world is, it's now completely underwater. The world that we've known it has completely changed. And maybe, maybe there have been times where you've felt like you've been drowning. Well, today, I want to build a boat. Now, some of you hear boat and you think, hey, we need to build an ark because this has been like a flood, right? This has been so seismic and such a big paradigm shift. I've, I've lost my job or I've changed my job or I, I'm changing the way I'm, I'm doing school or the way my kids are doing school and life has been so radically transformed, it feels like a flood. And so the boat that we need to build is an ark. But others of you are like, uh, I'm not really sure that we need a boat, right? Like, yeah, there's been some rain, but this is probably just a big puddle. What we really need is a good pair of rain boots, right? And we'll just wade through the puddle, and in a minute, everything will be fine. We'll be back to normal like that. Or maybe you go back and forth between the two. One minute, you feel like, hey, I've kind of adjusted to this new normal. I've got this new rhythm of quarantine. And then uh, in the next minute, you feel like butter that spread over too much bread. Well, today, the boat that I want to build with you is a sailboat, a sailboat. And this sailboat isn't going to get you just through the uncharted waters of COVID-19 pandemic and quarantine. No, this sailboat is designed to get you through the uncharted waters of life. Here's what I'm going to tell you today. Because of our ultimate safety in our great high priest... Draw near to God, draw near to God, hold fast to our confession, and consider one another. Let me say that again. Because of our ultimate safety in our great high priest, draw near to God, hold fast to our confession, and consider one another. So as we build this boat, and Greg, can I get that image here of the sailboat up here? As we build this sailboat, the hull, it, you, right where you live, your safe place in the boat, there from the bow to the stern, that hull is going, we're going to find that in verses 19 and 20. That's access to the Father. And that hull is made of steel, and that steel separates you from the water and keeps you afloat. And that steel of the hull is the great high priest. And by the way, that goes down into the centerboard. That centerboard or keel keeps the boat from flipping over. It keeps it stable. And that steel or keel is the great high priest. And then on that boat, what propels the boat, what moves it through the water is the sail. And that sail has three points. And that top point of the sail that attaches it to the top of the mast, we're going to find that in verse 22. It's going to be drawn near to God. And then what attaches the mast there to the bottom, uh, what attaches the sail to the bottom of the mast where it intersects with the boom there, that's going to be the command in verse 23, hold fast to the confession. And then what stretches that sail out to the end of the boom there is going to be the third command, consider one another in verses 24 and 25. And because this is a part of the one another series, we'll give more attention to the final point of that sail, consider one another. Thanks, Greg. So let's look then here at Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. 
and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So far, God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word, may he write its eternal truth upon all of our hearts. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we come to consider this ultimate safety, this boat that we have because of our great high priest that gives us access to you, I pray that you would convince us of our sin and misery, that you would enlighten our minds in the knowledge of Christ, and that you would renew our wills by the power of your gospel, through the work of your Holy Spirit, and through the mediation of your Son. I ask that you would forgive the one who teaches his sins, for they are many. May we see Jesus and him only. Amen. So first of all, then, let's consider the hull of the boat, access to the Father in verses 19 and 20, and the great high priest in verses in verse 21. So in English, as we begin in verse 19, it says, therefore, brothers, and it's implied brothers and sisters, since we have. But that verb, since we have, is actually a participle. And so it would be better translated in Greek, therefore, having. And that participle, having, has two objects. Its first object is in verse 19, having confidence. And its second object is in verse 21, a great high priest. Having confidence and having a great high priest. And those two objects are related. We have confidence, verse 19, because we have the great high priest, verse 21. And this is a summary of the whole book of Hebrews so far. The author of the book of Hebrews has been telling you that Jesus is better. That's the theme of the book of, G of Hebrews. Jesus is better. The author of Hebrews is telling you in chapters 1 and 2 that Jesus is better than the angels. And he's telling you in chapters 3 and 4 that Jesus is better than Moses. And he's telling you in chapters 4 through 7 that Jesus is better than all other priests. Why? Because in chapter 8 we see that Jesus has a better covenant because it's a new covenant. And in chapter 9 we see that Jesus has a better tabernacle because it's a heavenly tabernacle. And in chapter 10, we see that Jesus offers a better sacrifice because it's a once-for-all sacrifice. Do you know how Israel used to have access to God? Can I get that image of the tabernacle, Greg? We read this this morning in Leviticus 16, right? One day a year, on the Day of Atonement, the seventh day of the tenth month, one person, the high priest, could come in through the outer courtyard, go into the holy place, peel back the veil, and walk into the Holy of Holies. But in order to do that, he had to, first of all, get dressed up in fancy clothes. And then he had to come with offerings. He had to come with a bull that was a sin offering for himself. And he sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat there on the Ark of the Covenant that represented the presence of the living God. And then he had to also offer not only a bull for his own sins, but a goat for the sins of the people. And he would sprinkle its blood also on the mercy seat. And then through the blood of that bull and that goat together, it would be a sin offering for the holy place and for the altar. And then in the Holy of Holies, he would present a live goat, the scapegoat. He would take his hands and he would put it on the head of the scapegoat and he would impute the sins of the people onto the scapegoat. And then he would have that scapegoat led out into the wilderness. And after he had that access to the Father, he would walk out of the holy of holies and walk out of the holy place. And then he would change out of his fancy clothes and he would bathe. And then he would offer two rams as burnt offerings at the altar of burnt offerings, one for himself and one for the congregation. And the burnt offering was completely consumed. And so it showed complete and utter devotion. You see, the high priest had access through the sin offerings of a bull and a goat for atonement. 
and through the burnt offerings of two rams to show devotion, through washings and clothing, and after all of that, he was cleansed. And Leviticus 16, verse 30 says, you shall be clean before the Lord from all your sins. And so year after year, it was atonement and devotion and repeat. It was sin offering and burnt offering and repeat, not to mention all the other offerings that were offered daily or weekly or monthly. Worship was a bloody endeavor. You were always covered with blood. And that, that was how we had access to God. That was how we approached the Father. Thanks, Greg. But brothers and sisters, that was just a prelude. That was just an introduction. That was just a rehearsal of the reality because as Kelly prayed earlier from Hebrews 10 verse 4, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. You see, the day of atonement was just a sign pointing to a greater reality. Right? The tabernacle was just an earthly representation of a heaven, heavenly reality. It pointed to a greater high priest who, because of his sinless perfection, did not need to offer a bull for himself. But instead, he offered a better sacrifice. It wasn't a bull. It wasn't a goat. It wasn't a ram. No, this priest offered a lamb. The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, the priest was the sacrifice. And this sacrifice didn't need to be offered again and again and again. It was offered once, only once, for all time. And to demonstrate the finality of that sacrifice, when Jesus died, the, the veil in the tabernacle, that curtain, between the holy place and the holy of holies was torn into from top to bottom. Why? Because now we have access to the Father all the time, every day, morning and evening, summer and winter, at home and in your car before COVID-19 and during COVID-19, not just one day a year. And Christian, that access to the Father should give us incredible boldness. It should give us incredible confidence. You see, we have ultimate safety. And safety is something that's at a premium these days. What if I could promise you that COVID-19 wouldn't hurt you, that I could just kind of wave, like, blah, 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 right? And everybody out there listening now is immune to COVID-19. Would that change the way you interacted with the world, the way you lived your life day in and day out? Fear would be gone, anxiety gone, right? Worry gone, fretting gone. You could enter the world with confidence and with boldness, right? But oh, brothers and sisters, the safety that we have in Jesus is so much greater than immunity from COVID-19. This safety says sin can't hurt you and death isn't the end and injustice won't last, last forever. This safety promises you the ancient fairy tale that we've all longed for all of our lives of life, of eternal life, life the way it was meant to be. This safety promises you the great adventure of the new heavens and the new earth where everything sad will come untrue. It's the safety of a lifeboat that will never sink, where you will never drown. And that lifeboat will finally carry you safely to the other side. Oh, won't you get in? And so we have confidence in the safety of the lifeboat. The author of Hebrews says it this way, therefore, brothers and sisters, having confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way, not the old way, the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and having a great high priest. And right here between verse 21 and verse 22, the book of Hebrews pivots. 
You see, for 10 chapters, the author has been giving you information and data and more information and more data, and now he's going to take all that information and he's going to show you how it matters. He's going to rub it into your life. He's gonna move from indicative, right, facts and data and information to imperative commands. This is how you should then live. Since we have confidence and since we have a great high priest, therefore, and now we have three plural imperatives. And this is the sail of the boat. And each of them start with let us. Let us, verse 22, draw near to God. Let us hold fast, verse 23. Let us consider, verse 24. And with all of this let us, we should probably make a salad, right? A sail salad. You could say, okay, so, so there's your, your dad joke <clears throat> for the day. So let's look at the three points of the sale, because these three points of the sale represent three dimensions, three directions of the Christian life. In verse 22, we have the upward direction towards God. Let us draw near to God. And in verse 23, we have the downward direction towards truth. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope. And in verse 24 and 25, we have the outward direction towards people. Let us consider one another upward, downward, outward, towards God, towards truth, and towards people. And here's the thing, you need all three points of the sale. You see, a healthy Christian life where you see growth and maturity always has three directions. If there are only two, it's no longer a sale, right? If it's only attached at two places, it now functions as a flag, right? It no longer catches the wind, it's just flapping in the wind. It no longer propels the boat forward. It only waves around, causing distraction. You need all three points of the sail, upward, downward, and outward. So let's look then at the first point of the sail. Verse 22, let us draw near to God, the upward direction. Now, <clears throat> I grew up on Sesame Street. So when I hear draw near, I think of Grover's explanation of the very complex subject of physical proximity and distancing, which is a very popular subject these days. And Grover's explanation goes something like this. Near, far, near, far. And <laughs> we're supposed to draw near. Oh, but Grover, this isn't just physical proximity. This is heart proximity. And you see, our hearts are always drawing near to something. We're always looking to something for our meaning, identity, value, and worth. Why? Because we're worshiping creatures. We're worshiping creatures, and yet, with this glorious and remarkable access that we have to worship the Father, instead of drawing near to God, all too often, we find ourselves drawing near to so many other things, to success and performance and acceptance and reputation and safety and wealth and our kids' well-being and romance and family and job security. We forget about the access that we have to the Father, and we live our lives as functional atheists. And so the author of Hebrews says, because we have confidence, because of our great high priest, let us draw near to God. And this is an act, this is an act of faith in our heart, right? Keep reading, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with a true heart in full assurance of faith. And my immediate response is, I can't do that, right? I don't have full faith. I don't have a true heart. But if you're like me, I have good news for you. You see that true heart, that full faith, don't come out of us. They come from God. Keep reading. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed 
with pure water. So who's sprinkling our hearts clean? Who's washing our bodies? And by the way, you can hear the echoes of Leviticus 16 in there with the cleansing and the washing. Who's sprinkling our hearts clean? This is what theologians call the divine passive. You see, God is the one who is sprinkling our hearts clean and washing our bodies. God is at work in our lives. In other words, not only does God provide access, he's also working inside of us to sprinkle our hearts clean and to wash our bodies so that we can draw near to him. But then the second point of the sale, verse 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. This is the downward direction. We are anchored in the truth. You see, Christians have always dealt in truth. We are a confessing people. We hold to certain essentials. And for the last 10 chapters, the author of the book of Hebrews has been confessing this. We have access to the Father through the finished work of Jesus. We have access to the Father through the finished work of Jesus. And Christian, that is your only hope in this world. That's our lifeboat. And we need to confess it again and again and again so that we don't forget, so that we don't get distracted, so that we don't lose hope. Hold fast to that confession. And how are we supposed to do it? Keep reading. Without wavering. And again, I think, I can't do that, right? My hope ebbs and flows. It's waxing and waning. The pandemic has exposed that more than anything else. But Christian, your hope isn't up to you. Keep reading without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. You see, your hope rests on the faithfulness of the one who promised. You see, the author of the book of Hebrews is singing, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Hope, at its essence, is about the promises of God. One commentator talks about those promises this way. God has promised that a day is coming when war will be ended, when justice will flow down like a waterfall, and when death and pain will be no more. God has promised that a time is coming when no mother will weep again for her lost children, when all will have a place to live and food to eat, and when finally many will be gathered home to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And those promises are certain and steadfast, because the one who promised is faithful. Now, in verse 22, we saw faith, and in verse 23, we saw hope. And if you're trying to complete that triad, what is it that you might be looking for in verse 24? We have faith, hope, and and love, right? And this is adding to the three points of the sale. In verse 22, you have faith, and that's the upward direction towards God. Verse 23, you have hope, that's the downward direction toward truth. And verse 24, you have love, that's the outward direction towards people. Faith, hope, and love. And this triad is the totality of the Christian life. It's all three points of the sale. So let's look lastly then at our final point of the sale in verse 24 and 25. Let us consider one another. This is the outward direction. Now, Hebrews 10, 25 has become a very popular verse these days. In fact, it may be the most used verse during quarantine and pandemic. Look at verse 25. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. And this has frequently been used to argue that we should continue to meet together on Sundays for in-person worship, regardless of circumstances. And this often comes off as a litmus test of whether you're a really good Christian, right? If you really love Jesus, then you'd still show up to worship every Sunday, even in the midst of a pandemic. But have you considered the shut-in? 
who can't get to corporate worship week in and week out because of their circumstances? Have you considered the sick person who's highly contagious? Have you considered the parent who is staying home to care for a sick child? Have you considered medical personnel, doctors and nurses who occasionally are required to work on Sundays because patients need care every day of the week? Have you considered them? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we should skip corporate worship on a whim, right, because we have indigestion or we stayed up too late binge watching Netflix. We need to schedule our priorities. And corporate worship is essential to the Christian life. So how do we understand this participle? Not neglecting, not neglecting to meet together. Well, neglecting has an intentional and ominous sense to it. It's not just forgetting. The New American Standard and the King James translate it as forsaking meeting together. The NIV says giving up meeting together. And the idea here is abandoning or deserting meeting together. In other words, this is a deliberate turning away from the people of God. And it's also habitual, keep reading, not neglecting to meet together, as is what? As is the habit of some. So this is an intentional and habitual turning away from the people of God. In other words, this is more about those who have decided, I don't need the church, right? The Christian life is really about the Bible, Jesus, and me than it is about those who are temporarily moving corporate worship online during a pandemic in order to protect human life. But there's more. The participle, not neglecting to meet together, is paired with another participle, its opposite. And when you understand those two participles together, it helps to unpack the meaning. So what's the opposite of not neglecting to meet together? Well, it isn't have your butt in the seat every Sunday. And it's not being at church every time the door is open. Keep reading. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but what? But encouraging one another. You see, instead of moving away from the people of God, the command is to move towards the people of God. Instead of habitually forsaking God's people, we're asked to deliberately and intentionally encourage God's people. You see, I think that you could come to church every Sunday and still neglect meeting together. This isn't just about attendance. It's about attitude. This isn't just about walking through a door. It's about showing up in somebody's life. This isn't about entering a building. It's about caring for a body. This isn't about sharing a space. It's about knowing someone's heart. It's about encouraging one another. And so what does encouraging one another look like? Well, it's explained back at the beginning of verse 24, how to stir up one another to love and good works. In other words, the goal of encouraging one another isn't to feel good about yourself or to feel safe or to feel happy. There are those maybe product, byproducts of encouraging one another. The goal of encouraging one another is to produce love and good works in our lives. You see, biblical encouragement helps us to become more and more like Jesus. Jesus' life was full of love and good works, and we're to encourage one another in that direction. Do you have relationships like that? You see, friendships are always pushing you in one direction or another, and biblical friendships always encourage us towards love and good works, to be more and more like Jesus. But encouraging one another and not neglecting to meet together, they're secondary verbs. As participles, they're describing another verb, a primary verb. And it's there at the very beginning of verse 24. Let us consider. Let us consider. And in the Greek, the object of consider is one another. And the King James shows this. Greg, can I get that next slide, please? The King James says it this way. And... Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. 
Now, it's a little bit awkward in English, but it shows that one another is the object of consider. In other words, out of considering one another flows love and good works, verse 24, meeting together and encouraging one another in verse 25. Thanks, Greg. So consider one another. Consider one another. The idea here is that the Christian life isn't meant to be lived alone. Consider one another. Yes, you're commanded to draw near to God and you're commanded to hold fast to the hope of your confession, but those two aren't enough by themselves. You also have to consider one another. God made relationships essential to the Christian life because we are relational creatures. And maybe you've felt that even more accentuated now in lockdown and quarantine. And by the way, this is true even if you're an introvert. Near the beginning of the pandemic, a friend said, I've been training for this all my life. I'm an introvert who's been homeschooled, right? But even if you're an introvert, even if you're an introvert, you're still a relational creature. The Christian life isn't meant to be lived alone. Let me tell you the story of Aaron Ralston. It was April 26, 2003, and Aaron Ralston was canyoneering in the slot canyons of southeast Utah. And he's climbing down into one of these narrow slot canyons, and as he's climbing down, he slips, and on his way down, he reaches out and grabs for an 800-pound suspended boulder, and the boulder begins to fall down with him, and it crashes down at the bottom of the canyon and pins his right hand to the side of the canyon wall. But here's the problem. Aaron was alone. He hadn't told anybody where he was going, and he, hadn't, he didn't have any way to contact the outside world, and he nearly died. But on the sixth day, after he'd run out of food and water and he was hallucinating significantly, he used a dull pocket knife to amputate his right hand, repelled 65 feet down a canyon wall, and walked six miles towards his car that was parked eight miles away. He collapsed and was found uh, by tourists who rushed him to the hospital in order to prevent him from bleeding to death. Oh, Christian, don't try to live this Christian life alone. You might lose more than a hand. Consider one another. But you see, considering one another doesn't happen haphazardly. No, it's intentional and deliberate. It takes contemplation and observation and focus. It's an other-centeredness that moves into someone else's life with curiosity and compassion. What does that look like here at Redeemer? Well, when we consider one another at Redeemer, we're looking at those who are different than us. You see, we are, as the body of Christ, we're Democrats and Republicans, we're black and white, young and old, rich and poor, longtime Christians and new believers, died in the wool Presbyterians, and those who heard the word Presbyterian for the first time in the new members class. We're used to long services and short services, but we all have the same Savior. We're all united by the same faith. We all have access to the same Father. You could say we're all in the same boat. And this rich, beautiful diversity at Redeemer reflects the church in heaven where God has gathered for himself people from every tribe and language and people and nation. And we get a glimpse of that beautiful diversity every time we gather here for worship. But as we're considering one another, let me stop and ask, let me meddle, let me pry just a little bit. Do you really know, do you really know those who are different than you at Redeemer? How well do you know those who don't share your political views or your ethnicity or your family status or your Christian experience? Are you inviting them into your home? Not during quarantine or pandemic, but you know, at other times. Are you inviting them into your life or are you only reaching out to PLUs, to people like us? Malcolm Gladwell, one of my favorite secular authors and podcasters, talks about the idea of moral license. 
And the idea is this, once you've checked a particular box, then we can feel good about ourselves and we don't need to worry about that box anymore. So in 2010, Australia elected their first female prime minister, Julia Gilliard. And they said, see, we're not misogynists, we don't hate women. And then they proceeded to mistreat her and treat her as inferior because she was a woman. There were rude and disparaging and even sexist remarks. And I fear that one of the difficulties that we may experience here at Redeemer is that we can check the box. I go to Redeemer. I go to an intentionally multi-ethnic church. I'm reaching out to others who aren't like me. But then we only ask people like us into our home and into our lives. And our church begins to drift into an all-star team church. We play on the same team on Sunday, but the rest of the week, we're only practicing with our own team. Are you learning about people who have different perspectives and experiences than you do with kindness and curiosity? Are you willing to learn about the contours of someone else's world? Consider one another. And by the way, I think Satan wants nothing more than to accentuate our differences in order to divide us, right? He, he might use politics. He might use social issues. Or in this season, there are so many other things that he might use, right? Some might say, we should stay home and social distance. And others might say, we need to open the economy. Some might say, everyone should wear a mask when we come back to church. Or others might say, I'm never wearing a mask when I come back to church. Some might say, you have to come to church during quarantine. Or others might say, we should only worship online during quarantine and we will be tempted again and again and again to confuse areas of Christian freedom with essentials in the Christian life and impose our views on everyone else. And then, and then, Satan will have us right where he wants us, isolated and alone. But the author of Hebrews says, consider one another. In December 2019, something landed in Washington state from an Asian country that has the potential to change our way of life. I'm not talking about COVID-19. I'm not talking about coronavirus. I'm talking about the giant Asian hornet. Can I get that next image, Greg? Now, the giant Asian hornet is about three times larger uh, than a honeybee, and it has an orange head and those teardrop Spider-Man eyes and these black mandibles out front, and its quarter-inch stinger isn't barbed, so it can be used to inflict pain again and again and again, and it's a dominant predator. It can easily kill larger insects, like the praying mantis, for example. Thanks, Greg. But don't worry, it generally isn't going to mess with you unless you mess with it. That is, unless unless you're a honeybee. You see, the giant Asian hornet hunts honeybees. Why? To feed off of the fluids from their bodies and to feed the honeybee larva to their larva. The giant Asian hornet can kill 12 to 15 honeybees per minute. One video shows 30, just 30, giant Asian hornets killing 30,000 European honeybees in the span of several hours. They come to the beehive and they're outnumbered a thousand to one and the bees rush out in waves, right? But the bees are helpless. The bees can't penetrate the hornet's armor and the hornets cut them apart with their mandibles. But over in Asia, Japanese honeybees, who have lived alongside these hornets for several centuries, have developed a different strategy. Instead of rushing out and attacking one-on-one in order to defend their hive, these Japanese honeybees let that scout hornet come into their hive. They alert the hive, and then they wait, and they wait, 
And when the hornet gets in far enough and attacks the first bee, then the Japanese honeybees strike, and together they all swarm the hornet, they surround the hornet, and they begin to vibrate their bodies. And because they can tolerate two degrees more heat than the hornet, that swarm turns into a little oven and bakes that hornet in about 20 minutes. You see, if like the European honeybee, we rush out by ourselves to take on the world, the flesh, and the devil one-on-one, we'll be slaughtered in seconds. But if we consider one another, if we truly deeply swarm together, then like the Japanese honeybees, we can bake our enemy, consider one another. Because, our, because of our ultimate safety in our great high priest, draw near to God, hold fast to our confession, and consider one another. And then, then, we'll have wind in our sails as we rest in the lifeboat that never sinks and will be carried safely to the other side. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, there are so many things in these days that could divide us. Would you help us to consider one another, to remember at the center of all that we do that we all have access to the same Father through the same Savior by the same faith, and so we are united together as one body. Would you help us to consider one another as we move into this world together. We ask this in Jesus' name, who unites us by his blood. Amen. Receive now the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace until the day breaks and the shadows flee away. And all God's people said, Amen.